grab water, whatever you need. Uh, this event is being recorded and you can return to watch it immediately after it's been completed. Uh, my name is Isaac Poole and I'm the artist program manager water, at Creative Capital. Um, my pronouns are flexible and I'm a white person with long honey colored hair that's pulled back into a knot. And I'm sitting in front of a big shiny piece of silver mylar that's hiding a few different things in my studio. Uh, I'm joining you tonight from the unceded native land of the Lenape people, also known as Brooklyn, New York. I encourage you all to introduce yourselves by placing your names, pronouns, and locations in the chat. I wanted to take a moment to recognize that even in this time of COVID-19, when we are physically distant, that today we are grounded and connected through this workshop to Creative Capital. Creative Capital's location, while currently referred to as Lower Manhattan in New York City, is on the ancestral, unceded homelands of the Lenape people. In saying this, we recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color in the United States. We are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as a stand-in for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability and equity. We hope that all of you tuning in will feel welcomed and included in this work from your own perspective places. As one step towards that, we encourage you to visit the resource at native-land.ca, which we will put in the chat. Creative Capital, for those of you who are not familiar, supports innovative and adventurous artists across the country through funding, counsel, and career development services. As part of our mission to amplify artists' voices and provide tools and community for artists to thrive, we are pleased to host these workshops and conversations. You can learn more, see upcoming workshops, and subscribe to our newsletter on our website, creative-capital.org. I'm so pleased to introduce you tonight to Shital and uh, Pablo Hoguera. Shital Prajapati is the Interim Managing Director at Common Field and works as an arts advisor through her agency, Lohar Projects, focusing on public engagement, special projects, and organizational planning. She serves on faculty at the School of Visual Arts in the MFA Fine Arts Program and is the board chair of Art and Feminism. Pablo Hoguera is a Creative Capital awardee whose work involves performance, drawing, installation, theater, and other literary strategies. He is often considered a pioneering figure in the field of socially engaged art and is the author of many books, including Education for Socially Engaged Art and The Parable Conference. He is currently Assistant Professor of Arts Management and Entrepreneurship at the College of the Performing Arts at the New School. I will let Sheetal and Pablo provide a few details about themselves now. Uh, Sheetal, if you'd like to go first. Thank you, Isaac. Um, my name is Sheetal, I go by she, her. Um, I am talking to you from Brooklyn, New York as well. Um, I am a brown skinned and brown eyed woman with short black hair that's pulled back. I'm wearing dangly gold earrings with blue and cream flecks on them. And I'm wearing a long sleeve navy. Thank you, uh, Isaac and everyone uh, for having us here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Uh, I am Pablo Elguera. Uh, I go by he, him. I'm a white Mexican man with brown hair and a gray sweater uh, and uh, in front of a white background. Thanks, Thank Pablo. <laughs> I also want to quickly acknowledge that our captioning tonight is provided by Caption Access. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, and our ASL interpretation is provided by TRJ Bridges. And thank you tonight to Vern and Lisa. Um, I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Tonight's workshop, as I just mentioned, is being live captioned. Um, and if you'd like to enable captions, click on the CC button in the bottom right section of the video window that you're looking at right now on YouTube. We are also providing captions through stream text if you would prefer to see captions in a separate browser window. I will place the li link to stream text uh, in the chat shortly. You can send questions to Sheetal and Pablo in the chat throughout the evening. They will be spending some time at the end of the session uh, to answer as many of their questions as, you, as they can. Please feel, feel free to also use the chat to introduce yourselves and talk with each other. This session will be recorded and available on this page immediately after it's completed. 
If you registered for the session in advance, we will also send you a link to the recording tomorrow. Please make sure that you are not unsubscribed to Creative Capital's newsletter to make sure that you receive messages about this and any other upcoming programs from us. Okay, with that, I am excited to uh, hand it over to Sheetal and Pablo. Thank you, Isaac, and thank you to the entire team that is providing interpretation and captioning for tonight's event. Um, Pablo, thank you for being here today for this conversation. It's my pleasure. Always a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Shiro. <laughs> so um, before we dive into the conversation, um, part of the reason that I invited Pablo to be in conversation with me about this particular topic is because um, our work intersected for about six years at the Museum of Modern Art, where we both worked in the education department in the public programs division of the department. So I just want to lay that context out before we dive in, because we will talk a little bit about our practice now in relationship to that experience and other experiences we've had working in museums and in education spaces. So to start our conversation, I am I would love, Pablo, for you to talk a little bit about a project that you are working on right now. Thank you, Shiro. Um, so um, I, I as, as you mentioned, I, I worked in museums for many, many years. Um, and uh, as of uh, October of last year, I finally took the plunge and then went into uh, a completely different line of work, which was teaching. Uh, I say different line of work in a funny way, because in a way I have never stopped being myself. I have always been an artist. I just happened to be an artist who worked in a museum. I, and now I'm just an artist who stopped working in a museum. And as part of that transition, uh, where I'm teaching in college uh, at the new school, uh, I also decided to, um, to go through a process of um, perhaps thinking of, of that experience of working in a museum and working in that capacity in the arts. So what I started was a column, uh, which is um, titled Beautiful Eccentrics. And I imposed onto myself the, the rule that I had to write every single week uh, a text. And it goes back to an, an experience that I had earlier when I was younger, I was working for a newspaper where I had to submit a, an art review every week. And uh, it was a good exercise, you know, for the minds, you know. And uh, so I've been doing that. And uh, my feeling, um, for, first of all, I, I, for me, writing is really important as, as a visual artist. Uh, it allows me to organize my thoughts. It's to me, writing is like the drawing of the mind. You know, it's like being able to like, um, try to make sense of what you are looking at, what you're living at that moment. And, uh, and it allows me then as an artist to come up later with what comes next, you know, with makes, making sense of ideas. And I feel that uh, art writing in general, um, the art press in general, is very limited to very specific uh, aspects, whether it's writing an art review or theorizing about art. And, um, and I feel there's a, a large um, aspect that is missing, which is the sociological um, um, aspect of art, which for us who work have worked in education is, is very important. So I, I try to pay attention to what I think is a very human aspect of art making. And that's what Beautiful Eccentrics is about. Thank you. And the reason that I wanted Pablo to bring this up first was because when we were chatting about uh, this conversation, uh, I mentioned to him that I had read some of the, the posts um, on beautiful eccentrics. And he, he said, probably off the cuff, Pablo, he said, well, this part of this is trying to make sense of my time at MoMA. And I really liked thinking about this writing practice as a way to make sense of your time in this particular space of a museum practice. And both Pablo and I come from a background of spending a large part of our careers working in museum education. 15 years for me and what, 25 for you, Pablo? 29. 29, <laughs> right. So even 
Throughout both of our careers, we've always done many other things. Pablo mentioned, you know, approaching and being in museums as an artist who is also a museum educator. And I think for me, I kind of had the opposite where I really came in to museums as an educator and, and, and very, very steeped in that work. And over the years, that work took me into other spaces of being an advisor, a curator, and an artist in my mid thirties. And so um, I also enjoy kind of thinking about both of our practices in that parallel, but kind of complementary way. Um, and in, in this series of posts that you're, you're writing about, um, you talk a little bit about um, this notion of education being very critical to fulfilling the mission of museums, but really not getting a lot of attention as it relates to press or even the identity of institutions in a lot of cases. Um, and I thought that might be a good place for us to start. I would love to hear you talk a little bit about kind of not, not, not necessarily why the intention isn't there, but kind of the criticality of education fulfilling a museum's mission and all the things that it does that curatorial can't and other departments can't do. <laughs> That's a big question, but, but I think it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, so what, what I, the best analogy I can make, you know, uh, for education at, in a museum is something that uh, some of you might be familiar with. It, there's a book by Isaiah Berlin called The Hedgehog and the Fox, uh, which goes back to an ancient uh, Greek uh, um, fable uh, about these two animals, uh, which are the hedgehog and the fox. The hedgehog is an animal that knows only one thing, but knows it very well. And the fox is an animal that knows many different things, you know, and uh, and I feel that the hedgehog is a curator and the fox is the educator. Because what happens is the, hedgehog, the, the, the curatorial profession is a profession about knowing a material very well. You know, it's, it's deep, having deep knowledge of a particular movement, of a particular medium, of the particular practice of a single artist, of a group of artists. And, and, and the curatorial departments in, many muse in, mo in most museums are full of people who have very strong backgrounds in our history, uh, who know a lot about their field. And like in particular, in MoMA in particular, I mean, there, there's so many different departments. There, there used to be seven departments. Uh, I don't know how many there are now, but the, the, there's film curators, there's print curators, there's drawing curators, there's cu creators of, um, of uh, design and architecture and so forth. Um, and as an educator, you know, you don't get hired to, to only do education about architecture, only do education about sculpture or photography. You do education about everything. Our specialization is in audiences. And that's where uh, Sheetal and I used to, you, you, Sheetal and I, you, we used to work there in, in the adult program. So our specialization was in people. And uh, because what we were trained to do was to create conversations and reflection for those particular kinds of audiences. But aside from that people specialization, we needed to do education about everything. So our regular day in our lives would be like meeting with a curator about Yugoslavian architecture. And the next, the next meeting was really with a curator who was organizing a show about an African installation artist. And the next one was like doing a performance a meeting about like a, a contemporary like a Chinese artist. So it really is, runs a whole gamut. So as an educator, you have to become that, that fox, that, uh, that animal that knows a lot of different things and, and what we also understand as a generalist, right? Uh, and and these, two, these two forces, let's say, these two elements, I guess, complement one another, right? Because uh, I think a museum needs both things, needs the, the, one, the person that knows a lot of things and the person that knows one thing very well. <laughs> And, uh, and I always saw that relationship. However, you know, um, it's, 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 not a, uh, it, it's not a knowledge that is always acknowledged, I guess, you know, or, or, or valued. And, um, and, you know, one thing that I actually really loved about being an educator was that in a certain way, and, and it, it is honestly something that I felt sometimes exasperating about my colleagues, like everyone was so self-effacing, like no, everybody's so humble. Like nobody wanted to take credit about anything, you know. Like everybody was so generous, and almost like we, like it was almost like a like a monastic kind of communitarian, like a 
collectivity, you know, like, oh, no, no, it's not about me. You know, it's about, it's about people, you know, right. it's, and it's, it's a really wonderful thing, but sometimes I, I feel like, you know, but you, you really need to take some credit, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, because you are, your contribution is valuable, but, but it is a, a really, uh, a wonderful characteristics of, of being an educator. And that's why it's such an enriching, um, <clears throat> I guess, activity. I mean, we could speak more about that relationship, but you know, that's more or less more. Yeah, well, you brought up this word that we've talked about a little bit, which is a, a generalist. And this um, story that you brought up, thinking about educator being a fox and, and what that actually means. And I think about a fox as a creature that has to be very agile and very flexible. And this notion you brought up of educators specializing in people it's really interesting to think about what it means to specialize in understanding, knowing, learning with people. And we at MoMA have the fortune of working specifically with an age specific audience, adults. And, but even within that space, it's so widely varied. And at MoMA, we were also working with adults that were coming from all over the world inside the space itself, as well as our audiences nationally and internationally. And so when we think about the idea of specializing in people, I think about having to be like the best generalist you can be. Because not only to Pablo's point where we're having conversations about different disciplines of work, different periods of work, different artists, but we were also having conversations about how taking each of those body of, bodies of knowledge into public space with different groups of people simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The specialization of content that curators offered us was incredible, but it was our job to bring it to people. And I think there is, there is an, a little bit of an invisible space there around how that process unfolds. But my point in kind of, in, in kind of emphasizing what Pablo is saying about being a generalist is that it requires a really wide range of skills. And um, kind of coming back a little bit to some of Pablo's reflections on his time in museums, um, Pablo, you wrote a little bit about, I think this is a really good metaphor, like the, the role of being a moderator in a panel and how your entire job is actually to facilitate the people on the panel having a conversation, not centering yourself, but actually moving yourself out of the center and empowering other people to have the dialogue that uh, they will have. And I think a lot about that with being an educator and that takes a set of hard skills, but that also takes a set of um, soft, but very important interpersonal skills. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing, Sheila. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think about this a lot, but um, part of being a public servant, I think, um, which is another way to put it, is, is that you, I mean, you're providing a service to the public. So the final goal is really what is that service like, you know, and it's not really about like your authorship or your, your, you and the center of the picture. This is why I said, you know, a good moderator is somebody who basically disappears, you know, who's basically like, you forget that they are there. Kind of like, an, an, and I compare it to an Uber driver, you know, like, I mean, if you had a good Uber drive, a ride, like you didn't think about it, you know, like it was just smooth and you just got home and then it, everything's fine, but a really bad Uber drive, like you will never forget it. Like if you almost crash or they almost like kill a cat <laughs> in the street or they're, or they're like crazy. I mean, like you, you will never forget that person. Right. That's not what you want the experience to be. And I think by the way, I mean, like the curatorial experience is similar. I, I remember Apollo Herkenhoff, the, uh, the famous Brazilian curator used to say that, you know, like, you know, a great curator is somebody who basically you don't see their hands. You know, it, you, you see an exhibition and you see something really wonderfully made. Well, maybe it's like a great chef, you know, like it's just really wonderful. But like, if you start noticing the chef, you start realizing, oh, there's something wrong here, you know? Right, yeah. right. I, but, and, and you know, that was, that was actually, and I know there's many artists right now in this conversation with us. And, and to me, I, I have to say, you know, as an artist, that was a really amazing lesson to me. Because in, as artists in art school, we are trained to become like the center of the universe like where you are in your studio, like making these kind of like genius work supposedly that will later be shown and admired by millions, right? <clears throat> and it's very healthy to be in a position where you have to collaborate, where it's not about you, where it's about 
creating about uh, tailoring an experience for others and and that the reward is the that that experience was uh, really adequately presented or conveyed you know so it, it's a really wonderful thing to to, to learn and that, that I feel I, I got a lot of from museums yeah I think you know to your point uh, this is reminding me of something that I have thought about a lot in my work as an educator in museums but also in my work in many other areas um, of my practice which is this concept that we don't really do anything alone. And there is something, there is a value in that, that I think the space of education provides. And I also think that we, you know, I think museum educators joke a lot about like, oh, well, part of the, you know, yes, we may not be way up the totem pole within the institution, but we can get away with a lot because we're doing a lot of our work through the back door or coming in through the basement, right? And so that kind of less visible space allows us to potentially be more experimental. And I will say that I feel like Pablo and I pushed that kind of uh, possibility of experimentation in our roles at MoMA as much as we could. And I think part of the reason we were able to do that was because we were, a lot of our work is really quiet. And I think a lot about that in my other work too. And even when I was working full-time in museums, I was doing a lot of other quiet work outside of my job that I either wanted to or felt compelled by that may or may not have to do with my full-time job. And it's interesting now, like even when Creative Capital invited me to do this series and said, you know, what do you want to talk about? And I was like, okay, I want to talk about interdisciplinary practice. It took a long time for me to identify myself as such, to be honest with you all, because I think when you work full time in an institution for a, a long time in your career, there is this value associated with the place that you work and it has a relationship to your identity. And since my work as an artist has always been much quieter and emergent, my other work as an organizer, doing advocacy work, teaching at universities, all of that stuff has been secondary to my identity when I was working full time. And what's been really interesting in the last few years since I started working independently outside of any institution, one institution, I feel like uh, this is kind of a, a moment in, in my career and the work that I'm doing where all of those things are coming to bear and I'm allowed to call myself what I need to call myself when I'm doing certain kinds of work. And I'm not kind of, in a space where there is a dominant title to who I am and what I do. And I will say that that has been a long process in my career. And I bring that up because I also, Pablo, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about this. You know, you identify as multiple things, but I also think that you have areas and kind and types of practice that you identify with most strongly. And when we were talking, one of the things you mentioned specifically was performance. And, and you talked a little bit about why performance was kind of like a bedrock for you. And I thought maybe you could share a little bit about that and, and kind of your experience working in multiple ways simultaneously. Um, yeah, so performance is really important to me. I think I was a performance artist before I knew I was a performance artist. And I think I will always be a performance artist and I will be a performance artist after I'm gone. <laughs> it's like the one thing that defines me completely. And, you know, it's funny, I um, I completely agree with you Sheila, about like this whole idea of definitions. You know, we are always, we're, oh, life is always a constant struggle to fight against definition. You know, because we are always being defined. We're always defined in terms of of, of, of everything, you know, of race, of, of gender, of like, there's expectations that you will be a, a certain kind of person because of what is perceived that you are defined as, right? Yeah. Um, and I think this is, it's really important for, for an artist to defy those, those pressures of being defined. Uh, when I started as an artist, as, as a student, you know, I wanted to be a painter. You know, I was coming from Mexico. I thought I would be a muralist like, you know, Diego Rivera, you know? And of course, you know, I was, I, but, I, but at the same time, I had this other interest. I didn't have to fit it into a mural, you know? And then I discovered performance, and I realized that performance is the infinite um, uh, genre. You know, it's, it's where everything can fit in, you know? Like, a gesture can be a performance. Like, a, a drawing can be performative. Like, there's all these different ways in which something can become a performance. So, so I, 
I, I fell in love and I still love that, that concept, you know. Uh, even today when I, I see my practice as primarily a socially engaged art, you know, I see that as part of performance because it's part that progresses in time. You know, it, it, it's a practice that also redefines itself all the time. And as, as someone working within an institution, I perhaps at first intuitively and then more like, like directly, I felt like it was really useful to do, to, to, to be like, do a little foxy things, you know, kind of like a <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, anti-hedgehog things like, you know, yeah. like that was like no narrow minded, but kind of like open ended, you know? Yes. And, and I was, I felt, and I think you might remember this, you know, like we, we were at a, working at a museum at a time when social practice was rising and it was exploding all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the museum was mostly like, well, we don't do, we don't deal with that, you know? Uh, now, a museum like MoMA, which is about history, which is about posterity, you know, they have a very hard time dealing with the present. You know, this, this is, and this is true of the entire history of the Museum of Modern Art, by the way. I mean, like, if you look at Fluxus, for example, in the 70s, the curators at that time, they would not, couldn't care less about what Fluxus was. They would be like, oh, that's not for us. We are, we're going to show Mondrian, you know? Um, and uh, so I felt like, you know, we needed to do something with... Uh, the artists who were making social practice. So we started an initiative within our department called uh, um, Artist Experiment, which was inviting artists to work with us in a, in a very collaborative way, which was also new for the artists. It was not, they were not being invited to produce an art project. They were produced, they were invited to work with the public to do different kinds of experiences. So we became a laboratory for the artists, you know, and uh, we, nobody knew what it was gonna happen or what, how, how each project was going to unfold. And it became like a really wonderful uh, adventure for all of us in, in figuring out what we were going to do. So we, we really didn't have a name for it. You know, we didn't, I mean, we didn't have a name of what that was exactly. It was kind of social practice. It was kind of an education program. It was somewhere in between, you know, but what was important and, and I have all, that has always been my mantra, by the way, is like, it doesn't matter how you call it, what it matters is what it, it does. You know, that's that's to me like the really crucial. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think on a like at a more like kind of pragmatic level, artist experiments also did something that I think was novel in in the scope of a museum, not not just MoMA, which was as we brought artists in to start exploring their interests in relation to the institution, we went far beyond the collection and exhibitions. Um, when we worked with Nina Kachadorian. Um, our primary collaborations were with the facilities and sometimes security department because Nina was so interested in the concept of dust within the institution. Um, when we worked with um, Xaviera Simmons, our work was very focused on unearthing um, political moments from the archives of OMA. And I think, you know, throughout these collaborations, I found myself with Paul Ramirez Jonas. We worked with the volunteers sitting at the information desk. And so even at that very pragmatic level, the work that we were bringing into the museum was about the intersection of kind of under spaces that were understood and had very clear definitions to our public and even to us, bringing, in, bringing artists into a space where we could not just question that, but really explore different ways of understanding it. And thinking of the museum itself as an object to be interpreted, understood, and unpacked together, and not just the art objects that were housed within it. Um, and I think those components are also equally interesting to think about in terms of what, what Pablo is saying um, around the role of an educator being a generalist and our role within these institutions of being the facilitators of ideas to a large, large audience of people we were able to think about embodied experiences of a painting. We were able to think about movement in relation to a sculpture. We were able to bring some of these works outside of themselves for the purpose of understanding and exchange. And I think Artist Experiments was a really good example of how we did that, not just with our audiences at the museum, but internally within the structure of the institution itself. Wouldn't you agree, Pablo? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's two things I want to say about this. Um, 
so this this collaboration um, that we proposed to artists was a multidisciplinary um, endeavor, right? Because uh, our logic, I think, was you know we we are on hedgehogs in a certain way. We know many different specific things. We know how to create a, a lecture. We know how to organize a workshop. We know like very specific things. But the artist is like has brings other kinds of knowledge to destabilize you know everything else. And then we just come up with crazy ideas, you know, like. Caroline Wooler will be like, let's do a class where everybody teaches one another. And we're like, well, we have never done that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and we're like, okay, well, let's try it. So we tried to do peer learning, which was completely unheard of in a museum environment. Or we had a, a, a group of artists, I mean, a, later there was a group of artists who um, wanted to do something, a performance with all the titles of all the artworks in the collection. You know, um, and uh, and that was like something that that sent the curators like on a rage. Like, how can you? You're not. You can't do that. That's that's proprietary. You know, we own those those titles. And we're like, you don't own any titles. You know, like you know, like nobody owns a title of an artwork. And, but I'll, they they would always come and stir the pot, and like we would become the pot stirrers, and we would get in lots of trouble doing that stuff. You know, but there's one more thing I want to say about. Uh, and this is really about the artistic practice, that I think there's a really interesting relationship between multidisciplinarity and intuition. Like, like as artists, you know, we always bring like some kind of sense of where we want to go, but without completely knowing what is it that we're going to do. You know, a multidisciplinary, it, it's kind of like the, the, the environment that allows you to do to, to try many different things, you know, to 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 test things out. You know, it's the set of tools that we have there at our disposal. It's like it's like going going on an expedition, and we have like like a few things that we can use, so we can make a fire, and then we can eat, and we can like um, survive. You know, and and I think those those two things are always in dialogue. You know, like this not knowing. Uh, and the set of knowledge that you already have to help you survive and, 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 and move forward. I think it's, it's, it is really kind of like an artist, an artist's way of thinking, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, Pablo, I really like that you brought that up. And I actually, I can't believe we're almost at the end of our time for talking with each other because we've barely gotten through all the things I thought we would. But that that leads to this question that we, we talked about a little bit, which is, you know, what, what is it that we can learn from working in these multi or interdisciplinary environments where not only do we have to kind of employ a range of knowledges, but we're also taking in a, a kind of a, a, a wide range of information. Um, for you, what have you learned from that experience over your career? Um. It's a good question. I mean, I feel that the the greatest thing I have learned is to have tolerance for discomfort, <laughs> like understanding that I will put myself in a situation that that is unpredictable, that is difficult, you know. But the but to plan and to try to have a safe uh, life is ultimate death. You know, like that, that's, that's really what, what I cannot possibly tolerate. Like what, what I, what I want is to go to places that are, that have, that are unexplored, that are, that are difficult. That that's part of what it is being an artist, you know, mm -hmm. like, of course, you know, you, you can always go back and just make like impressionist landscapes, you know, yeah. but, but, um, but that, that is not like something that will challenge you, you know? And, and I think what, what the, the, the real urge, the real hunger of, 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 of inquiry, of intellectual inquiry is precisely putting yourself in, in unexpected places because of curiosity, because of obsessions, because of a lot of, or because of craziness. <laughs> I don't know why, but like, it, it just takes us there. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think that's, that's what, where intuition takes you. Yeah. And I, I, I remember, I think it was, of all people, I think it was Matthew Barney who once said in a lecture, you know, most, like most of the time I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> or like he basically says something to the effect of like I I just make this thing, and I'm not really know why I'm doing it, you know. But then there's a point where you finally kind of make sense of it. But but this um, drive of being prepared for that discomfort of not knowing is very important. If if you know what the outcome is going to be anyway, it's perhaps not that interesting in the first place. 
Yeah, I, I like the way that you framed that. And when I when we were talking about this question of like, what do you learn from that? I think about a very specific moment early, early in, I guess, my education, my senior year of undergraduate, um, I had, that was the period of time that I like discovered for the first time in my entire life that somebody might pay me money to work in a museum. I didn't know that was a thing. So I was kind of discovering art and the art world and what was possible during that time. And I did something impulsively that I never thought I would do. And I signed up for a studio painting class. And I, I took this painting class, it was an oil painting class, and I fell in love with it. I realized later, not because I then became a painter for the rest of my life or even paint now, because it was the first time since I had sort of understanding and learning about art within the context of a museum that I felt a connection to the creative process. And I continued to paint throughout the time I was in graduate school after that. So for about three or four more years during the entire time I was studying, I didn't take another painting class. I got a graduate degree in arts administration. I didn't even get an MFA. But that practice for that five years was really critical for me to learn about education, for me to learn about art history, for me to learn about administration putting myself in a situation that I'd never thought that I would be in and then finding something in it that I didn't know I could access or that was possible for me to understand was really, really transformative. And that, I, I, I share this story because that has been a reoccurring theme throughout my life where if I have a curiosity about something even if I don't know anything about it, if I put myself in that situation, usually the outcome will be good in some way, even if it's not what I expected, even if it's not what was supposed to happen. And I think that that idea of curiosity and kind of this uh, recognition of the fact that there's never a time we can know everything and there's something really beautiful about that. To me, I think about that both as an approach to artistic practice and for me, an approach to my professional life in the arts. And I, I do have an artistic practice, but it's a very small part of what I do. It is necessary for me to make that work to do all the other things I do. It is not necessary for that part of my identity to be visible all the time. But I do think, I think about that experience in undergraduate a lot because I don't know that I would be doing what I'm doing now unless I had kind of taken the leap and put myself in a situation of like, well, let me pretend to be an artist. I mean, yeah. that's kind of what I thought I was doing. No, I, I think what you are bringing out, Cheryl, is something that I think is really important for this conversation of multidisciplinarity is that, I mean, you came into art from a very kind of unexpected place, right? And like, or it's not, that was not, yes. it was not that you, you said, I'm going to be a museum educator, you know, like I never, ever said I was going to be a museum educator you just like simply arrive and like in in the field of museum education like almost no one is someone who who's actually studied museum education like there were people who did study maybe psychology or other things or or they were just artists like and they were just sort of landing there or or they, they came from other places and that's what made the field so rich and and that is in fact what I think many uh people have argued uh that enriches any field like coming with a completely unexpected like perspective on a new field, you know, it, and, and how you can kind of uh, change things around by just offering a completely different perspective. And, you know, one, one of the things that I think is the most scary part of being an artist, to me, like the most scary part is not failing or, or, or whatever failure it might mean, but it's falling into an academic pattern but becoming like so specialized that you only like become only good at one thing that you define that is good, you know, and then you, you create a, a tribe of the people that make that kind of thing. And then you kind of close your mind to everything else without acknowledging all the possibilities and other practices, yeah. you know? So it's, I think it, it in our practice or L, L everywhere, it's always important to have like outside energies and draw from outside energies. And, uh, and I think that's, that's just really so important for anything we do. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that, you know, 
we're getting to the end of our time here and we are going to take some questions from the audience. And Pablo, you, the last thing you said kind of answered the question that, that I wanted to pose to us at the end, which is like, why should we, why does anyone work this way? And I think you articulated that really beautifully, like the why uh, of working across multiple spaces is a kind of enrichment and set of possibilities that might not exist otherwise, so if you, in, in the most simple of terms. Um, I just, I also wanted to add to that. I think that, you know, it's been really interesting um, since I, for the past three years to, uh, and I'll go back to this, this notion of like trying to fight being identified in, in a one specific way or defined in one specific way or the other. And as Pablo mentioned, that is both a professional and kind of identity thing. Um, certainly for me, I've had a lot of experience being identified as the woman of color in a space or the only person of color in a space for much of my career. And what's been interesting that once I moved out of the structure of working in organizations full time, I still work with organizations in, in my practice. Um, I was able to leverage these identities instead of combat the limitations they put on to me. And I don't know if that is an experience everyone will have moving between, organiz um, between organizational work and ind independent work. But for me, I was able to activate my identities in combination with each other in new ways uh, because I was able to create an interdisciplinary space for myself and I just, that's something I wanted, I wanted to share because I think that, again, that was an emergent thing that did not happen right away. Um, but it was really important to me identifying myself as an interdisciplinary practitioner. Um, here's a question that might relate to what you were saying, but it, it asks, did you ever have trouble working with other departments of the museum? <laughs> I have found it difficult to get things done when working with institutions when there are silos or lack of value of, of education departments? You know, um, when I worked full-time in museums, absolutely. Absolutely, all the time. We face that at MoMA, and I even face that at other places. But I tell you what, like, I've been, I've worked with a few museums and a few uh, arts organizations in the last three or four years, and I have the ability to bring siloed departments together as an outsider. You do, yeah, I know that. Well, it's just, you know, coming from the out, coming from outside of those set of politics and being able to say, well, this project would actually function better if this group of people work together on it, and here's why. And it's hard for a director who's paying a consultant to say no to that. I mean, <laughs> excellent response. Excellent response. Excellent response. Um, so I think maybe with that, we will but, go. Oh, go ahead, Pablo. Well, I'm just reading the questions now. <laughs> is that yeah. okay? <laughs> I was gonna say, so let's go to the questions. Um, but the next one is as someone who was a, a fox and aspiring to be a hedgehog, how would you suggest maintaining a generalist approach while encouraging those around you who aren't to embrace that mindset? It's a really good question. Do you have thoughts about that, Pablo? <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, that well, I mean, I think we cannot change who we are. I mean, it's very difficult to change who we are. We have, we have intuitive abilities, you know, or we don't, you know. Um, but I think we can, we can practice them. And I think I, one thing that I needed to always check myself is, was to, uh, to realize, for example, I, I was, and, and Sheila knows this because we work together, you know, that I was many times in the clouds and like always thinking like these thoughts and like being completely incompetent at actually making things happen or not very effective. And, and, I, and I, what I started doing, it was like I, I valued my colleagues who had those abilities that I did not have. So I guess the response is really a collaboration is really, really important and recognizing your uh, shortcomings or your, the aspects of yourself that, that are not perhaps the strongest, your fortes, you know. And, and, and I think that's where collaboration becomes really important, where you, where you uh, acknowledge what, where you can contribute best, but mm -hmm. also learn how to, to rely and, and, and support those colleagues around you who can, who can bring the other thing. And these are, these are really good lessons also for artists who collaborate. You know, like collectives will always tell you, like, you know, they, 
they 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 intuitively know who is good at what you know mm -hmm. and, and they they become really successful because they are able to join those forces like those those, those like uh superpowers you know mm -hmm. in, in producing something amazing yeah. but that but but that that cannot happen if you don't have that recognition that, that i'm 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 good at this but i'm terrible at that or you're good you suck at that but you, you you're very good at this you know yeah. so that's i don't know co yeah. collaboration is to me I think that's really important. And actually, I'm going to just piggyback off that to address the first question, because Pablo, I didn't realize you were asking me a question from the, <laughs> from the chat. So my bad there. But uh, what Pablo says about collaboration in relation to working with other departments that may not value education department, not bodies of knowledge as much, is very important. And collaboration in that particular set of situations, I will tell you my experience at MoMA was about building trust. So for example, the head, of our, the head of our archives, uh, this brilliant woman, Michelle. I didn't really have a lot of chance to work with her, but I did get to know her. And by the time we were ready to work together, we had a great relationship. And I wouldn't say she, she's someone that valued education highly, but that experience of building trust between us before ever working together was really important. In terms of convincing other departments about the value of education, I will say that I did have a strategy for that. And I employed it not just at MoMA, but at other museums that I worked at. And I will credit my arts administration and policy degree for this, which is once I realized I needed something from a department, I would actually take time to think about what was most important to them, what they needed. And I would try to find ways to kind of embed what I needed into meeting their larger set of goals. And sometimes that worked and sometimes that didn't. It took a lot of extra work, but it was, I did sometimes have to work around the devaluing of what I was bringing to the table by kind of understanding how I could support some of their larger goals through the work I was doing without them knowing I was kind of bringing that there anyway. Um, so I just, I wanted to say that, and that part of that is collaboration because you can, sometimes you have to collaborate with people you don't actually get along with, but you still have to work with them. And so there are ways of like finding shared goals with each other that I think can lead to productive work, regardless of kind of the value that's placed on each person's set of skills. But I do agree with Pablo that that is a very important part of collaboration in the end. There's, a, there's another question I wanted to answer here. <clears throat> it says, the artist mode of not knowing exactly what you're doing while you're doing it, how do you square that mode with granting institutions? They want proposals that set out the outcome at the outset. I think it's a, it's a really excellent question, and it re makes me realize that I perhaps did not fully articulate what I was, what I meant initially. And I, I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll do an, an example. Um, when I did the, my creative uh, capital project, which I was really fortunate to get a, a creative capital grant for, was it was called the School of Pan American Unrest. My proposal was to drive from the top, from Alaska to Chile, uh, organizing conversations with people about what is America, Ameri what, what are the Americas. Um, so that had a very specific purpose, and I was interested in knowing that. But the thing, the reality is like the bottom, I, I, I never really knew why I felt I needed to drive from Alaska to Chile, you know? It was kind of a, um, <clears throat> a really kind of difficult question, you know? And I did not realize it until years later, you know? And, and it actually was for a very, very deep personal reason and it was because my brother and my father had died you know and i there and this is like a re, i mean it sounds kind of absurd but i have you know, often is said that you know you take on a very long journey when you have like a tragedy in your life you know and that was a really critical aspect of my journey you know of trying to understand who i was you know after i had had such a loss but it, it's nothing that i will ever put in a grant that was that would be ridiculous you know because also the other thing was true. I really I had a legitimate desire to understand um, the, the Americas in a different way. But, but it, it's, this, this, these are the kind of things that you can never put in a grant, that it just like really goes up to a deeper level of, of psychology or philosophy in your life that, that is impossible to articulate. But again, that's what I meant when I said, like, you know, we don't really know ultimately those deeper reasons why we do certain things. You know, and sometimes the reason is something that you will never share with anybody else. You know, it doesn't really have to be that way. But but what drives us, it, it can be sometimes really powerful and very mysterious that you don't really realize it until you see it many years later. You're like, oh, 
I never thought about I never thought about it that way. But yes, it was within me, you know. And uh, maybe it sounds romantic, but uh, but I think it's true. I think it's it's just like an aspect of who we are. Yeah, I think I also think that there, in that work of grant writing and proposals for the projects that you are hoping to get supported, there's also the the kind of the exercise of thinking about where you're applying to. Um, there are places that there are grants that are very outcomes driven in terms of of supporting artwork, and then there are places like Creative Capital um, that are interested in supporting works that are in development that but have clear sense of not necessarily an outcome but purpose. And Pablo, when you're talking about the project you did that was funded by Creative Capital, even without sharing that personal part of the narrative that was motivating for you as a human, I think the narrative probably did inform purpose in some way without really needing to articulate the outcomes. Um, yeah. And I think that is an important distinction between like outcomes and being able to articulate the outcomes of a project versus like the purpose of it in some ways. Um, there are a few questions that like, I think we missed. So I'm gonna go back to them, Alex. There's, there's one for you. So let's let's ask oh. you this one. You know Should what? I, I read it, but it's for both of us, Pablo. And this person just doesn't quite know. <laughs> so I'm gonna read it out loud. You're just trying to <laughs> escape the responsibility of answering that one yourself. <laughs> Did you experience any pushback or conflict from those you worked with at your full-time job when taking on projects and work that lived outside of that job? If so, how did you handle it, Pablo? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could probably write a book on this. <laughs> that's that's material for a no, for a tragic novel. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think that any position of leadership you know, um, does create conflicts, you know, from the outside, you know, always, like, I, it always bothered me. Like, I mean, I always had this impulse of wearing a, a, a suit jacket, you know, when I was at the, at, at the museum. You, always, you never saw me a single day not wearing a suit jacket, you know, I, because I felt it was res I, my responsibility. But then, but then, then that, that also led people to think that I was just like these bureaucrats, you know, or like these kind of uh, functionary, which was fine. I, 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 think, I didn't care about that, you know. What I cared was what we were producing. And of course, it, I think it's really not different from being an artist. You know, they will always get criticism from out, out of directions, you know, or worse, even you will get indifference, you know, that would just like no, people not even like, you no, know, like mentioning what you're or, or paying a, a, or at least acting as they're not paying attention to what you're doing. Yeah. But that's just kind of it's part of the course, right? Like you, you know that no no one is gonna be completely happy with what you are doing, and that can never ever be the reason why you do or something or don't do something. You know there has to be like a like a higher purpose to the things that you do. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know what you think. I mean I think I think what you're saying is really important for people to remember because it's true not everyone is going to like everything you're doing at all times, and that's not why you should do it. I will say that uh, I've been in work environments where I didn't tell people a lot of the things I was doing outside of my job out of either a bad experience with their reaction to it or out of general, like a, as a precaution. Cause I did not want that in any way to shape people's opinion of me because there can be, people can have all kinds of personal feelings about what other people are doing that they may not be doing, for example. I also think that um, the most conflict I've ever faced around that is when the things I'm doing outside of work produce better results for me in my full-time job, which hasn't happened a lot, but there have been a few times. And so I think, I think it is part, it was part of the reality that I had to accept when I decided that I was too curious to just do the work I was doing inside the museum, that there were other things I wanted to do. Some people took that in ways that I didn't intend it, but I will say that all that other stuff came out of genuine curiosity and care. And so in the end, it, I had to accept the fact that other people's opinion of what I was doing with my free time was just their opinion. <laughs> That's it. 
<laughs> um, let's see here. There, I saw one other question we might have missed. It said, if you could, if either of you could change something about museum education and collaborations with artists, what might that be to make the experience even more dynamic for audiences? I would make the director of education the director of the museum. Period. <laughs> And in fact, you know, what's interesting uh, to see in recent uh, years is the fact that many uh, individuals who were directors of education have become now directors of museums. And, and I think I find that really wonderful because really the, 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 the education field is a field that allows you to see the museum as a comprehensive whole. Not, mm -hmm. not just a place for connoisseurship or not just a place for fundraising or just like a place that generates revenue. It's a place that, that, that exists in a, in a social context, in a social cultural context. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that really wonderful that, to see that, that those individuals, and you know, of course I'm biased because I do come from, you know, we come from museum education, but, but I, I do think it's really wonderful to see those, um, like th those people being, uh, into positions of leadership and it's one of the greatest difficulties also that, that education as i think everybody knows you know tends to be the most diverse department in the museum and uh and it's very common that the music education department bring, has the most people of color and the curatorial department has the most white uh male curators you know or mass, m m white male individuals so Anyway, so so that the, the diversity of of education is really really crucial as you try to serve a diverse public. Yeah, I think I definitely agree with Pablo, and um, I would say something that I'm and I I definitely think all those things are moves in the right direction for making museums uh, more uh, open and welcoming spaces for a larger group of people. But I also during the eighteen months that I worked at Pioneer Works. When I started working there, and I, I say this because I think there was a lot of possibility in what I started to do there. I just didn't stay there long enough to like, I think see it all the way maybe through, which is I, when I started working there, they invited me to co be considered for their director of education position. And I had known Pioneer Works before, before that moment because they were in my neighborhood. And so I had been visiting the place and knew a lot of staff that worked there. And I said to them, I think I want to be your director of public engagement. And let me tell you why. And what I said to them was that you are an interdisciplinary art institution. You have departments in music, uh, visual arts, technology, science, and so forth. You need someone here not to do education, but to think about what public engagement it means across disciplines and across the institution. And the institution side of it was, if you've been to Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, it is a hundred plus year old factory building that has been renovated into a very open design art space. So even navigating that space was an interesting experience. During my time there, I I ended up kind of overseeing a division that included visitor services, that everything from design and signage to our front desk programming, as well as overseeing our day-to-day -day open hours operations. I did all of this under the umbrella of public engagement, meaning I approached all those operational functions of the institution from the lens of public engagement, that every part of this experience on site or online is a form of engagement that an individual or group of people are having with this institution or this brand. And that approach to me opened a lot of possibilities and also uh, broke down a lot of silos between different different practices, marketing and curatorial, curatorial and design, education and visitor services, all of these things had to, could be approached in a holistic way. And I just think that if museums thought more about their larger practice, as Pablo said, as public service, but that work as public engagement, um, there would be a lot more possibilities, just for artists in museums, but also for publics. Um, I know that we, we need to, to conclude, but I, I want to I wanna do a little, I want to say a, a, one thing about multidisciplinarity. 
you know, my final parting thought on this topic. Uh, we've talked tonight a lot about hedgehogs and about foxes and <laughs> and about like that that the, the relationship between the intuitive and like the and the and the narrow like uh, specific uh, knowledge. And and I my message I think tonight is more like the true multidisciplinarity is the balance between the two things, you know, between the, the, the ability to be intuitive and the ability to be pragmatic and like knowing something very specific. And, um, and I feel that the reason why sometimes gets get, get off whack is because one of those things um, get, do not get served well, you know, like, and we as educators, I think we are more intuitive individuals. You know, like I think the fox is the, the intuitive individual and, and the hedgehog is the is the more maybe perhaps the more like what we call the rational individual that they know something very specifically but i just want to conclude with an amazing quote that was attributed to einstein that goes as follows the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant we have a society that honors the servant and has forgotten about the gift in other words, you know, we live in the society that puts so much interest and, and especially American society into, into the specialization, into knowing something so well. And we have lost the sight of the big picture, you know, and I feel that true multidisciplinary is never losing sight of that big picture. And that's the role that, that I think we can play as artists, as educators, as cultural workers. Thank you so much. I think that was a perfect note for us to end our dialogue on. And I just want to say thank you one more time to the entire captioning and interpretation team for, uh, for allowing our dialogue to be accessible to a much wider audience. And thank you, Creative Capital. Yeah, and thank you, Shital and Pablo. That was a really incredible conversation. Um, I want to let everyone know who's watching that Sheetal is going to be presenting a workshop next month on May 11th, uh, so exactly a month from now, called Make Your Inter Interdisciplinary Practice Work For You. Um, and in that workshop, she's going to discuss how artists and their interdisciplinary practices can become a unique asset for building sustainable careers. Um, so I'm going to share a link for that in the chat now so you can check out more details uh, and register, find out a little bit more about the course. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us all. And I hope that you have a great evening. Thank you so much.